For this lecture, I plan to introduce you to hieroglyphics, Egypt's ancient writing system. Since the decipherment of hieroglyphics provided scholars with a means for understanding Egypt in greater depth. I will talk about the discovery of the Rosetta Stone, what it was, and how it was translated, as well as a very simple explanation of what hieroglyphs were and how they were read. So let's get started. The topic that I want to address today is how do we know so much about the Egyptian culture? One of the reasons for that is because they were prolific writers and record keepers, and fortunately, we have learned to read the writing system called hieroglyphics. And the story of breaking the code of hieroglyphics revolves around the Rosetta Stone. I'm sure most of you have heard of the Rosetta Stone, but perhaps know very little about it. And so I did a little research on this, and I thought it would be interesting to bring what I discovered to your attention. So how do we learn how to read this very enigmatic kind of writing? Now, obviously, it's based on uh, pictographs, uh, but what do those pictographs mean? Uh, were they sounds? Were they letters? Were they words? Were they concepts? No one really knew for some 2,000 years. Once Egypt uh, had passed away, so to speak, as a ancient culture, then it wasn't long after that that the ability to read and understand and speak Egyptian disappeared as well. And it is quite a story that made our understanding of hieroglyphics possible. So let's take a look at this. First of all, what does hieroglyphics mean? Basically, it's a Greek word that uh, composed of hiero and glyphos, uh, hiero relates to God, glyphos relates to words, and so basically what we're talking about here is God's words. This is a term that the Greeks gave to this uh, mysterious and ancient uh, writing system. Here we see a good example of very cleanly cut and beautiful hieroglyphics. The ultimate uh, key to the breaking of uh, this writing system is based upon what we refer to today as the cartouche. You see a cartouche here, carved on the side of this stele. What that is, you see a smaller one next to it over here. So we call this a cartouche, a word that has been given to us by the French. Cartouche basically means cartridge like a cartridge that you put into a rifle. Uh, and we'll understand a little bit better how, why the French give us this word uh, as we go along here. But in any case, what a cartouche was is a royal name. So inside that oval shape, the symbols inside of it denote a pharaoh's name. And the Egyptians called this shape a shen, S -H -E. E -N. And what it represents symbolically is a rope. So basically we've got a rope encircling symbols here, then tied to a stick. Why a rope? Scholars believe that it, it represented the Pharaoh's authority surrounding his people, or surrounding those things for which he had a responsibility. So it was recognized very early on that these cartouches contained a royal name. And that's going to be key to the ultimate discovery of how hieroglyphs can be read. So here is a very simple example of a cartouche or a shen that contains a royal name. So we've got this symbol composed of two shapes, this symbol and this symbol. Now, before it was understood what these symbols meant, no one could make any sense out of what these shapes were. Were they words? Were they letters? Were they sounds? Exactly what were they? But in any case, what we've got here is an example of, uh, as you see in the other examples of hieroglyphs as well, these are all iconic symbols, very simplified forms of the natural world, things to be found in a natural world. So in this case, those are representations of folded cloth. 
The middle one is a representation of reeds, and the leftmost one is a representation of the sun. Now, when we finally learned what this all, how this was all read, it was eventually understood that these symbols either stood for sounds or words. So in the case of the folded cloth, that's the S sound. In case of the reeds, it's the word mesas. In the case of the sun, the sun god's name is Ra, so it's Ra. So you can put together for yourself who this pharaoh was. That would be Ramses. Okay, and so this would be the way his name is spelled, one of the ways it is spelled with hieroglyphics. So here we see the old gentleman himself. Now, I want to take a little side trip here just for a moment because when we talk about hieroglyphics, it helps us to understand, interestingly enough, uh, something that has long been misunderstood about this sculpture of Moses, very famous sculpture created by Michelangelo. And the misunderstanding is associated with the horns on his head. Many people wonder why Michelangelo carved horns on Moses' head. Now we're going to get to that in just a moment. But meanwhile, some of you may be familiar with the fact that many people believe that Moses lived at the time of Ramses, and that Ramses may have been the Pharaoh of the Exodus. Now there is no proof of that, there's no physical proof of it, uh, and the name of the Pharaoh in the Old Testament is never mentioned, he's just called Pharaoh or King. But many people believe that uh, Ramses II may have been that Pharaoh. Nevertheless, it is kind of an interesting relationship that you see between these two individuals relative to their names. One of the things that's interesting to understand about pharaonic names is that they're usually made up of name of the patron god of the pharaoh plus other words. So in this case, we've got Ra combined with Messus. Now, Ra, of course, is the name of the sun god. So that would be the god that is Ramses' personal deity. Messus means to be taken from, is one interpretation of the word Messus. So, in this case, Ra, Messus, the individual that bears this name, is taken from Ra. So in this particular case, Moses, you can see a very similar kind of word. Moses, Messes, just replace that one vowel with an O instead of an E, and you've got Moses. So Moses perhaps was uh, given his name, because keep in mind that he was raised in the Egyptian royal court until he was a grown man. And as you can see here in this clip taken from the movie The Ten Commandments, the tradition was is that Moses was set adrift in a basket along on the banks of the Nile River and uh, was retrieved from the bulrushes or for, from the papyrus marsh by the royal princess, and she called him by the name of Moses, having been taken from the river. So that's kind of an interesting relationship between these two individuals that may have had some uh, personal associations in the ancient world. But back to this idea of the horns on Moses' head. Why does Moses have horns? Well, you can see these up here don't look very horn-like, but here's another example by Klaus Sluter from the Northern Renaissance era. And you can see that the horns on his head look really rather goat-like. So the, without question, these are horns. Uh, and so the question is, why did these artists depict Moses with horns on his head? It's a very interesting answer that's associated with the writing system of the Hebrews. Now many people would tell you that it was a consequence of a mistranslation of the ancient scriptures. But I'm here to tell you that it wasn't a mistranslation. It was simply a choice in translation. 
And what I mean by that is this. Hebrew was written only with consonants, just like we've talked about with Egyptian, with hieroglyphics, written only with consonants. As a consequence, if you did not know Hebrew and how it was spoken and written, uh, like later translators would, you had to insert the vowels that you thought were appropriate for the word that you were encountering or that you were trying to translate. So, when the translators of the 4th century Septuagint, and the Septuagint was, in a, was a translation of the Hebrew Bible, written in Hebrew, by Jewish scholars in the 4th century, as the period of the Ptolemaic rule in Egypt, when they came to this passage, where we have Moses coming down from Mount Sinai, after having spent 40 days in the presence of the Lord, this is what it says in the Septuagint, which is the version of the Bible that these Renaissance artists and Middle Age artists were using, the Septuagint. And this is what it says in the Septuagint. And when Moses came down from the Mount Sinai, he knew not that his face was horned from the conversation of the Lord. And Aaron and the children of Israel, seeing the face of Moses horned, were afraid to come near. So that's Exodus 34, verses 29 and 30. So, given the fact that this is the version of the Bible that these Renaissance artists were using, when Moses was depicted after his encounter with God, he was represented with horns, because that's what it says in the scriptures. Now, is that a mistranslation by the scholars that were translating the Septuagint, or was it something else? So, when those scholars came to the word associated with horned, they had two choices when translating that word, because the word itself in Hebrew consisted only of consonants, K-R-N. Naturally, they had to insert vowels that would determine how that word was pronounced and what it meant. So, if they inserted E's between the consonants to get Karen, that could be one possibility. Or, if they inserted A's between those consonants, they would get Karan. Now, Karen meant radiant. Karan meant horned. So, they had those two choices. Now, the question obviously is, if they had those two choices, when they came to that word, translating Moses' appearance when he came down from Mount Sinai, why did they choose horned? That's not a mistranslation. They simply chose to use horned instead of radiant. So, the question is, why? Well, the answer could be found in the fact that in the ancient world in which they lived, bulls were oftentimes used as a symbol of divinity and power and authority. And the horns, of course, became a symbol of the bull. So in the ancient world, a bull's horns were symbols of power and authority and of divinity. So Moses had just spent 40 days in the presence of the Lord, and so he was invested with the glory of the Lord to a certain degree. So that glory was represented through the depiction of horns on his head. His head was horned from his conversation with the Lord. Okay? So today, of course, having a horned head is not quite as meaningful as it was to those 4th century scholars. And so the word has been retranslated into something akin to radiant by the 16th century King James scholars. So what it says now is, And it came to pass, when Moses came down from Mount Sinai, he knew not that the skin of his face shone while he talked with God. And when Aaron and the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come nigh him. 
And that's kind of an interesting passage, regardless of how it was translated. Uh, in fact, it goes on to say that uh, in order to in order to prevent the Aaron and the ch- children of Israel from being uh, frightened by his appearance, Moses actually wore a veil over his face until uh, the effects of his visit with God in the on Mount Sinai had disappeared. Anyway, so now you know why Moses has horns on his head in the ancient art. It's not a mistranslation at all. It's simply a choice in translation that differs today from the way it would have been back in the 4th century BC. Okay, so now back to how we learn to read hieroglyphics. This revolves around the French Revolution and the aftermath of the French Revolution in the 18th century. So following the French Revolution, England, who was never a friend of France, declared war on France. At that time, Napoleon Bonaparte was just a general, but an important and rising general in the French army. He was sent by the French authorities to invade Egypt in order to interrupt English access to India this happening in 1798, so the end of the 18th century. So Bonaparte gathers his army and sails from Toulon. Toulon was a southern French seaport. Sails from Toulon with 50,000 soldiers to invade Egypt. Now along with those soldiers, very insightfully, he also took 167 scholars, scientists, engineers, and artists. Now the reason he did that is because he's going to Egypt. Egypt up to this point was a land of great mystery, many legends and myths and misconceptions about the the history of Egypt existed for the people of Europe. And Napoleon decided, I suppose, that as long as he's going there to conquer the country, he and occupy the country, he might as well study it in a scientific way as well. And so he takes along with him an old army of scholars and artists. So they sail from Toulon, aboard a large fleet, landing first at Malta, and then sailing on to Alexandria, where they disembark uh, in order to face the, uh, the challenge of conquering the country from its present rulers, the Mamelukes. So Napoleon marches on Cairo from Alexandria, meets and defeats the Mameluk forces, the present Islamic rulers of Egypt, uh, at the the, the so-called Battle of the Pyramids. And I rather like this painting, 19th century painting, of Napoleon astride his camel uh, as he leads his army into battle against the the Mamelukes. After their defeat of the Mamelukes and their occupation of Egypt, then the English, wishing to prevent the French occupation from continuing, sends their most famous uh, admiral, Admiral Nelson, with a fleet of his own. So he arrives with his fleet shortly thereafter, traps the French fleet Uh, in the bay near Alexandria and defeats it uh, in what's called the Battle of the Nile. So here we see another 19th century painting representing that uh, disastrous uh, battle from the point of view of the French, in which their fleet is virtually wiped out by Admiral Nelson, thus stranding the French army in Egypt. They now have no transport for getting back to France, of course. Well, while they try to find a way back to France in the aftermath of this naval disaster, the French scholars that that had accompanied Napoleon used the time wisely for studying Egypt. And so we get these images here of the time that they spent investigating this ancient civilization, this ancient culture, for the very first time in a scientific sort of way. So this is the first scientific investigation of this ancient land of mystery. So here on the left, we see 
the remains of a pylon temple in the sands of the desert that had begun to fill it up, uh, the ruins uh, of the temple that remained at the time of Napoleon. Here we see a French officer astride his horse, contemplating the head of the Sphinx as it rises out of the desert sands. And we'll talk about the Sphinx a little bit later on and how his head comes to rise out of the sands of the desert. And then over here we see, with the pyramids in the background, uh, again, some French officials, perhaps scientists, that are taking a look at a mummy that has been opened up, uh, the casket has been opened up here for their viewing pleasure. So this time spent in Egypt, while the French try to find a way of escaping uh, the clutch of the English uh, uh, Navy that is blockading them, spend their time uh, effectively studying this culture, really in a scientific way for the first time. Up to this time, any knowledge and study of Egypt had been primarily by grave robbing and looting and pillaging the country by European adventurers who were looking for treasure. Uh, and so they had very little regard for the history or the uh, scientific nature of the culture or certainly the artistic aspects of it or historical aspects. They were simply looking for treasures. So very little serious investigation of the country itself. But with, uh, with the arrival of the French under Napoleon, now we get the first scientific investigation. Now it was during this time that the Rosetta Stone was discovered. So here in the delta, we see the delta here. And nearby, in the west side of the delta, is a town called Rosetta. So the French army was uh, stationed, was garrisoned in Rosetta, and was digging fortifications in 1799 uh, in order to help fortify the place uh, and in their digging they accidentally came across this carved stele, this carved stone. Of course this is not the actual stone here but it's just a uh, imaginative representation of them digging it up, finding it in the desert dunes basically. So they find this stone they immediately recognize that it is of some significance and turned it over to the scholars that were stationed in Cairo. Now, I show you this image just to give you an idea of uh, the size, the scale of this stele, a carved stone slab is what this is. Today it's found in the British Museum in London, so I want to tell you how it got there. So this stele contained a dedication for a temple from the time of the Ptolemies. Now the Ptolemies ruled during the, the Ptolemaic era in late Egyptian history. Now the value of the stone was seen immediately since the proclamation was written in three different scripts. So we can see these three registers, the different scripts in which the proclamation was written. The topmost script was in hieroglyphic, a language that could not be deciphered, could not be read. The middle script was in Demotic, which we understand was a later version of hieroglyphs, written in more or less of a longhand sort of uh, manner, much easier to write than the drawing of the careful pictographs that were typical of formal hieroglyphs. But the key to this whole mystery is in the bottommost register, because that was written in Greek. And of course it was written in Greek because the Ptolemaic dynasty, ruled by the Ptolemies, was a Macedonian dynasty that spoke Greek. And so Greek was their language. And so we've got hieroglyphs, Demotic, and Greek. And of course the key to the whole thing was the Greek, because the Greek could be easily read by the scholars of Napoleon. And so they knew what the proclamation was. Now, meanwhile, Napoleon escapes from Egypt, abandoning his army, and returned it to France, leaving the French army to surrender to the English in 1799. 
shortly after the discovery of the Rosetta Stone. Now, as part of the agreement announcing the French surrender, the treaty gave all the French possessions to the English, and chief among those was this Rosetta Stone. It was then subsequently taken to England in 1801. In England, a man by the name of Thomas Young, who was a British scientist, became intrigued by the stone and the inscriptions on it, and began to study the stone in 1814, so 13 years later. And he was the one that was able to identify the name Ptolemy that was found in a cartouche. So remember, a cartouche is a symbol inside of which is a royal name. That cartouche is located right there, okay, in the hieroglyphic section. So this is the way that it looks. So if we read this, and you read it from, in this particular case, uh, you read it from right to left, it says these symbols say Ptolemy. Okay, we understand now. Of course, he didn't know that to begin with, but he realized that inside a cartouche is a royal name, and therefore these symbols must be the name of Ptolemy, and of course he knows the name Ptolemy from Greek, and so makes association there that perhaps those symbols, those pictographs, uh, in some way pronounce the name Ptolemy. Didn't know exactly how, but uh, assumed that that was what the situation was. So in 1822, the French linguist Champollion, and Champollion is usually the individual given credit for breaking the the code of hieroglyphs. Champollion takes over his, the study uh, begun by Thomas Young and completes that work until finally Champollion was able finally to, to understand what these symbols meant. Now how he did that, I have no idea, but <laughs> nevertheless, he's the one that's given credit for having broken the code at last. So what he came to understand is that the images represented sounds, or sometimes words, as we saw with messes, but primarily sounds. So hieroglyphs isn't just a straightforward uh, writing system like English is. Uh, there's a variety of uh, interpretations and determinatives that have to be associated with words in order to sound them out, but here's a very simple representation of this. So here is a chart that shows not all, but some of the most important symbols, pictographs, and the letter sound that's associated with them. So let's just see a practical example of this. So here's a cartouche containing the name of a very famous late Egyptian pharaoh. So let's see if we can interpret it. So uh, in, with hieroglyphs, words begin from the direction that the animals are facing. So in this case, the animals, the lion, this bird, they're facing to the right. So this name begins from the right and works to the left. And so it goes from the right to the left and from top to bottom. So what we've got here is this first image there. We see over here is a vulture, and that vulture the sound for that vulture is A. Then we have the lion, and the lion is right there in our chart. That's the letter L. This next one is a bowl or a cup, and that's located right there. You got two of them, uh, two similar symbols, one with a K and one with the X. We'll take the X in this case, so X here. This one is a pair of bolts, and it's located right there on the chart, and that's a Z sound. This is a feather. You see it right here, and that's the E sound. And then starting at the top and working to the bottom, this crooked line, this pointy line here, that's representation of water, and it, its sound is N. Then the next one is a hand, right there on the chart, and its sound is D. 
Next one is a mouth or a pair of lips. It's located right there on the chart. That's an R. And then we've got the bolt again. So the Z sound again. Okay, so there's our sounds as represented by the pictographs. Now when we put these together, okay, this is the this is the arrangement of those letters. A L X Z E N D R Z. So what does that say? Well, if you sound it out, it would be Alexandros. Basically. Alexandros, who is Alexandros? Well, Alexander the Great. And here's a representation of Alexander the Great when he was Pharaoh of Egypt. So that's the way the system works. Okay. So here's another uh, example that I've just made up here. So let's create a word. So I'm going to start with lips. Then we have the vulture. Then we've got the chick down here. Okay, then a leg and foot. And lips again. And then uh, upside down bowl. I'm not quite sure what that uh, stood for in the real world, but we'll just call it a mound. Okay, so let's sound this out. So the lips is R, the vulture is A, the chick is W, the leg and foot's B, lips again is R, and the mound is T. So uh, the animals are facing to the left, and so we arrange the letters that way. And what we've got here is my version of my name in hieroglyphics, Robert. Okay. The not so great. Okay. So here is, a, here is something for you to, to try to figure out on your own. So pronounce this king's name. So we've got an owl, got lips, we got a crown, and then a, a pad of some type, a mat of some type, and uh, some type of a brace or a hook, and then that's actually a house. So we put those all together. What have you got? M R N P T H are the consonants, and then if you uh, uh, insert the vowels that you think, think would go in there, you get what scholars typically interpret as mernepta, or you could rearrange it a little bit and, and say merempta. So either one of these would be valid. Usually Mernepta is the, is the way that scholars would spell this name today. So try it on your own. Uh, in the files uh, portion of Canvas, I have included this chart with a little car empty cartouche. And just for the fun of it, go ahead and insert your name. Create your name uh, in, uh, in hieroglyphics. See what you can come up with. It's kind of a fun little challenge.